Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Golden Boy, and we're going to talk about all the latest and greatest that's going on in the world of esports and gaming today. So today's topic is going to be about franchising in esports. This is a very hot topic, and for good reason, because franchising, it, it's, it's a big deal. So what exactly is franchising in esports? Well, for those of you guys who don't know, essentially all the traditional sports organizations like the NFL, the NBA, MLS, etc., etc., all use the franchising model. While traditional esports has typically been a tournament format, right? Um, or even seasonal formats that lead into relegations. And the reason being is because there are so many teams and there are so many players. Organizations such as Cloud9 or Complexity, Team Liquid, Optic Gaming, Team Envy, all these teams have come across either, you know, losing a tournament, falling in second or third place, maybe even lower depending, or maybe even getting relegated out of their league. We see relegation come through for the LCS, for the RLCS, and even for the Call of Duty World League. This is a, a kind of a troubling thing for a lot of these organizations because in their eyes, they find it difficult to be able to secure long-term funding because they don't know if they're going to have a presence past the first season. And the relegation process can be different depending on the league, but essentially, they all function the same way. The two or three or four, whomever, lower placing teams will face off against the up and coming teams. And the winner of those matches will then get a place in the league. But with franchising, that system is dead. No more. Most notably, the North American League of Legends Championship Series announced that they are going to be doing a franchise system. And this was back in the middle of the year. And a lot of people were wondering, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for the future? And even then, who is going to buy into this? Who's going to pay $10 million and get the slots? Who will be invited to get the slots? And now we know the answer. Names such as TSM and CLG, Cloud9, names very, very, important to the League of Legends scene will be joined by fresh faces like Clutch Gaming, which is the Houston Rockets, and Optic Gaming, a very popular Call of Duty organization that I don't even know why I explained that because I'm sure my audience knows who the hell Optic Gaming is, but you know, this is for the people who probably have never watched before, so you know, you gotta get the point. Meanwhile, teams like Immortals did not get into the LCS, and this is a team that is very entrenched in the League of Legends community, and a lot of fans were very disappointed about the announcement and although the reasoning seemed to be a little ambiguous on the side of riot and i'm not really an expert in riotology so i really don't know much about that my my experience with league of legends just goes from watching worlds and then seeing like you know skt dominate except for this year so sorry about that but still franchising is important and it's going to be making its way to the north american lcs another popular game that you probably have heard of is Overwatch. Yes, the Overwatch League, which its preseason will be starting very soon. I have a lot of friends who are going to be working on it, and I'm excited to watch it as a fan and see where this can go. Keep in mind, although it feels like Overwatch has been out for what feels like a century, it's actually, it actually hasn't been out that long, really, when you think about it. It, it, it could potentially have the this lasting effect on esports and it really got this conversation going about franchising keep in mind these things have been done before or have been attempted before you know the failed experiment known as the cgs tried to create regional franchises but you know esports just wasn't at the place where it is now for it to really capitalize on the popularity, capitalize on the engagement, monetize on the audience. It just wasn't there. And also they made some pretty poor decisions as well. That was before my time, but now we're entering into a new age of franchising and a lot of people seem to be either skeptical or hoorah, way to go for franchising. Personally speaking, I was against franchising, and to a lesser extent, I guess I'm still not the biggest fan of it. And the reason being, it's because it, it removes that element of the Cinderella story that we've become so accustomed to in esports. Seeing that team with no funding and just ambition rise to the top and become a prominent organization. One of the, the names that I remember off the top of my head was Revenge. This was a team that didn't really have much in the way of support. I remember seeing these guys play against Optic Gaming on a side station. I believe I believe it was at MLG Columbus or Anaheim, one of those two way back when. And I go up to them and I said, you know what? You guys almost took out Optic Gaming at UMG. 
I'm going to hook you guys up with a pass. And that's exactly what I did. Team Revenge will go on to play second place at the Call of Duty Championships. Like, that's insane, right? COD Champs and this Team Revenge. And while the look and, you know, the org and the players may have been different, you know, the essence was still the same. It was a Cinderella story. It was, you know, just people who wanted to make something happen, make a dream come true, become an organization, legitimize themselves in esports, and they did just that. And other things aside, while I, I don't know much about what's been going on with the Revenge organization, I could just say, like, those kinds of stories just cease to exist with the franchising model. What does happen is you get that long-term sustainability that a lot of these teams really want. As a matter of fact, I did have a chance a while back to talk about franchising in esports, and this was with IGN's Esports Weekly, hosted by Kevin Naki. I was a co-host there, and we actually talked to uh, the owners of Complexity and Team Liquid. Well, my question is this, though. Um, sorry to interject. Uh, but my, you know, one of the charms of what makes esports esports, and 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 I know that a lot of people really want to chase this sports carrot. Um, but one of the charms of it is the fact that you know Team Liquid had to start from somewhere, right, and had to start from the bottom and had to build its way up to where it is today. Same thing for complexity, right, and franchising. You know, if that's the term to use appropriately could uh, effectively shut that down, right? Could stop that up and coming team, that small group of guys that are super passionate about, uh, you know, esports and super passionate about their game. It could stop them from actually being something because they'll end up losing their players at a certain point in time, or they, you know, they'll get picked off by the big franchises. Um, and that's a broader issue altogether, but I guess, you know, I wanna get your guys' thoughts on that. I mean. You know, of course, for you guys, it's great. You know, there's financial stability, right? There's no doubt about that. But do you, I mean, personally, for me, I feel like it loses a little bit of the charm that makes esports esports. And feel free to agree or disagree. I mean, you know, obviously, this is something that deeply affects me. My, my thought process still remains the same to this day. Esports is about the grassroots. It's about the community. It's about building that love and that, that pride for the team that you've come to enjoy. And franchising removes that. Now, the dream has always been to get the non-endemic sponsors into esports and for those again who do not know endemic means your your headset companies your keyboard companies your logitech steel series astro gaming dx racer etc etc but your non-endemic companies these are the ones that aren't necessarily in esports and you saw it at rocket league championship series finals where you had sponsors such as old spice and cup noodles mobile like these are companies that don't really have a place in esports, but they're finding their way in because the demographic, it's so rich that there's no reason for these companies to get in because there's a demographic of like 16 to 25 year olds that they just want to ensure that they can put their sights on, that they can market to because those people, you know, they're starting to spend, they're getting into the working world. And what better way than to kind of put your brand in front than with a video game tournament? And now with Jack in a Box sponsoring Dallas Fuel, like that's just bananas. And I can only imagine what other non-endemic sponsors are going to get involved in esports because of the franchising model. Because they know that no matter what, their deal, their agreement will last for X amount of years, you know, X amount of months, whatever it may be, they know that it'll be there. It's no longer about sponsoring the event, which I guess is good and bad, and you could still do both, but it's also about putting a logo on a jersey, and that is huge, and that has a, a very strong impression on our audience. Think about it like this. For a non-endemic company, they're gonna look and see what are some of the statistics, and say what you will about Nuzu, but they're throwing out some pretty impressive numbers. One of those numbers is 190 plus million people are consuming esports content in 2017 alone. And who knows, that number could have gone up, it could have gone down, but all signs are pointing to, you know, going up. That's a lot of people, and it's expected to grow even more. This business, this industry is going nowhere. And in fact, Bryce Blum, one of the more notable lawyers in the esports space, wrote an article for ESPN that said that now that franchising is in esports, well, esports is here to stay. And I agree wholeheartedly because it just shows that this business is continuing to ramp up. And yeah, say what you will, esports aren't sports. And honestly, as a fan and a person who's been following it for 
damn near most of my life now feels like. I don't give a crap. I really don't care if people think that this isn't a sport because there are millions, and I mean millions of other people who feel the same way, who feel like esports, it is its own thing. It's awesome, and they just enjoy it like myself. So what are some of the pros and the cons? Well, you know, to kind of wrap it up in a nice little bow, the pros sustainability, long-term sustainability, being able to monetize. You saw the CEO of Cloud9, Jack, mention that now that they have that spot in the NALCS, they're going to invest into facilities. They're going to bring long-term partners on board, and they're going to just brand the crap out of it because they just want to be able to grow this thing much bigger than what it is right now. Some of the cons, well, you don't really get that that underdog story anymore. You don't get the team that comes from the open bracket and challenges the championship team. That just won't exist in this kind of model. And while those may be the high level pros and cons, when you think about it though, for a lot of the players, it could be a pro as well. It, it's long-term sustainability for them as well. I know I keep saying that phrase, but it's a fact. They can actually invest into the player's health and, ma and management, wealth management. If you take a look at the Overwatch League, they require that the minimum salary be $50,000 and they have to set them up with a retirement plan and health insurance. Like that's pretty awesome, especially for just playing some video games and having some fun doing something that you love. But then on the flip side, what about everyone else? What about the folks that are barely, barely in Overwatch League or the guys who are barely in the NALCS? What happens to them? Do they have any long-term plans? It's gonna make it a little bit more challenging for people to really break into it and invest time into it if they're not being compensated for it. So these are things that I think the esports industry as a whole just needs to figure out. And I don't think it's it's that challenging, if I'm being honest, because the structure still stays, right? Rogue is still Rogue, and Optic Gaming is still Optic Gaming. Cloud9 is still Cloud9. They could still you know, hire players and have them playing contenders. They could still set them up for long-term success. And even for the players who are competing in the Overwatch League or the NALCS, they have to perform because there will be an eager person in the contenders level that will look to take their spot. So it's going to be a very interesting next couple of years, honestly, because this thing's not going away anytime soon. And it's very clear that the money is there and the players need to perform. So that's where I'm going to leave it today. There's a lot to take away from this discussion about franchising in esports. And like I say all the time, I want to hear from you. This is a conversation. We want to be able to talk about these topics, whether it would be Star Wars Battlefront or whether it would be about Fortnite esports. Let me know. I want to know what your thoughts are on franchising in esports. Do you support it? Do you not support it? Why? Let me know. If you happen to enjoy this video, you can go ahead and gently touch that like button. Ooh, so good. Or you can go ahead and subscribe. You know, there's like a little red button down there that you can just go ahead and, boop and just click that as well. Whatever the case, I thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for just, you know, supporting it. I don't care how many viewers I get. I find this stuff to be super fun and I'm going to keep doing it for as long as I possibly can. So thank you guys so much. But that's going to do it for me for now, because I know that we're going to revisit this topic again and I can't wait to do so. But thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Golden Boy and I'll see you on the other side.